to embolden us in our upcoming visioning process, I've invited three of my colleagues here to share with us about a time in a UU congregation that they have served, where the congregation was able to unite in a meaningful and powerful way to live out their shared vision. So let's hear what they have to say. A little over a year ago, Unity Church Unitarian, the church that I serve in St. Paul, was asked to join the emerging Sanctuary Coalition of Congregations growing in the Twin Cities. And there was a press conference uh, looming, so there was some pressure to act quickly and join in the first few congregations that said yes. The ministers met with the board in a special session and asked them to consider becoming a sanctuary congregation. It was a long and thoughtful meeting, and many questions and concerns were raised. But ultimately, the board voted to become a sanctuary congregation. We didn't have a shower. We didn't have a place for anyone to live. But ultimately, we got a crew of Habitat for Humanity volunteers, members of the congregation, and they built a shower, and we turned one of our classrooms into an apartment. Our general counsel, concerned that we were breaking the law, set up a meeting with a community activist who was also a criminal attorney who worked with immigration and sanctuary issues. He asked me why we had said yes, and I launched into all of the reasons. He told me that we had to be able to justify our decision by our faith and our theology. You need to make a statement that is your religious statement, that is a Unitarian Universalist or a Unity Church Unitarian statement, and be prepared to say it when ice, if ice comes to your church. So I wrote the statement, and there was great concern that, that ICE would pick Unity Unitarian as, the, as a church to come and uh, visit. And so we printed 500 of these little cards so that if ICE came, anyone would have a card that they could say, and this is all that they, other than uh, some uh, pre prescribed questions. As Unitarian Universalists, we believe in the inherent dignity and worth of every person. We believe that all people are connected to one another. As religious people, we are called to welcome and protect the stranger and to offer safety and loving hospitality. In June, we welcomed a guest. It was not the Hispanic family that we had prepared for, but a, trans, uh, a, a Tanzani Tanzanian Muslim man. He has been with us since the end of June. We have been able to secure a, a social security card for him, and actually he is now free to come and go from our building and has uh, secured full-time employment. We are now beginning to work on his exit plan, working with immigration attorneys and uh, our sanctuary team. What I would say is that the entire congregation supported this issue. We had numerous forums, not to debate the issue, but to become better informed. We sent out an email informing the entire congregation that we had done this, looking at our ends and our vision and our mission statement and saying this is one aspect of how we bring this to life. The next day we got a phone call from the congregation curmudgeon. We all know who he is. We all have them. And I took a deep breath as I said, answered the phone and said yes. And he said, I want you to know how much I support your decision in doing this. I am 100% behind you. 
That was the only phone call we received. And it was such a great gift that even the curmudgeon came along, inspired by our decision. The entire congregation became a more hospitable place once we became a sanctuary congregation. It's if, it's, it's if we actually finally understood that we are all connected and that we are all called to welcome and protect one another and the stranger at our door. There's probably no more powerful moment in the life of a congregation than when the congregation consciously and intentionally places intention into its vision for the future. So during the interim period, part of my work is to encourage congregations to go through a visioning process where people come together and share deeply about their experiences and their life as part of a faith community. And the intention to share with the hope of creating a vision is absolutely critical to what comes out of those circles. It's important for members to hear one another share what makes the church special to them, what values do they see at the heart of congregational life. Uh, before I came here, I was in Columbus. And in Columbus, as we were beginning the visioning process, um, a number of the members wanted to have some training to become better volunteers in a program located in an impoverished section of the city. And so we created the Diversity Learning Circle, small groups that help members learn to build authentic relationships across difference. The intention that people brought to these circles was that they wanted to be more comfortable as they interacted with people who were different from them. And out of these circles, they came to understand the incredible diversity within the circle that we had, even though it was a circle, the first circle was of all white Unitarian Universalists, and people thought, oh, we're all the same, but they weren't. And so what came out of that, as, as people learned to navigate the diversity within the circle, was a way to navigate the diversity in the world. And as part of their training, they had little exercises that they had to do. Um, one of them was to start a conversation with someone they perceived to be different from themselves. And now I want to tell you about Oma, one of the members in that first circle, Oma and the Persimmons. Now, I know that may sound like the name for a rock band, but Oma loved persimmons, and Oma was also very worried about the whole idea of talking to a stranger. She was introverted. I have her permission to share this story. She was introverted. Talking to strangers, any stranger, didn't come easily to her, and she was really daunted by the idea of talking to someone who she perceived to be different. She was worrying about this a little as she went to the grocery store in search of persimmons which were her absolute favorite fruit. And Oma gave me a short education in persimmons that um, didn't really take, but she explained about the different types and how you can tell some are firmer and some are sweeter but not as firm. And she even gave me two different kinds of persimmons so that I could learn about these differences in these fruits that look so much alike to me. But as she approached the persimmon, she saw uh, another person, a woman who had brown skin and was wearing a headscarf, also looking at the persimmons. And Oma's first thought was, oh no, this may be my opportunity to talk with a stranger. She approached the persimmons carefully and 
stood there, and the woman who didn't speak English, and Oma didn't speak her language, they, they bonded over these persimmons. Um, it was an amazing story, as Oma related it, the way they, they picked up different persimmons and with gestures and head nods, they, seemed, they communicated about uh, the ways in which the persimmons might be good and ready to eat or maybe not so good and ripe or maybe just a different type. And it, was, it wasn't earth shattering, but for Oma, it was that first step to understanding that she could have a conversation with a stranger, that she could be vulnerable in entering into a conversation with a stranger, and that with all the differences in people's lives, there can still be some common ground, even if it's as simple as persimmons. Now, this intention to enter into authentic relationships to, to develop our skills and our courage to meet people where they are seemed to permeate the Columbus community. And so during the visioning process, it became very clear that Columbus wanted to create community, work for justice, and something, something, something about becoming a more multiculturally welcoming congregation. It wasn't that they were aspiring to go from where they were to being multicultural, but to be more welcoming, recognizing that so much of what is inside us can inadvertently be unwelcoming to others. So they were launched on that intentional search to become more comfortable with uh, differences, to discover differences within the congregation, and to engage diversity in all its forms wherever they found the opportunity to have an encounter. And so during the visioning process, it was at first not possible to articulate what it was that they meant when they talked about being more welcoming to different cultures and different people. But eventually this phrase emerged, engage diversity engage, not just welcome it, which can be pretty superficial, or celebrate it, which can, you know, like a birthday, maybe happens once a year, but engage it, to be willing to be vulnerable, to willing to be open, to learn about differences, and to be willing to seek authentic relationships with people who are different. This was a crucial moment in congregational life, but it didn't happen as a single moment. It happened as a process, as part of the visioning process, as part of the congregation's own um, self-education and training about multicultural competency. It came because people wanted to do good and be good, but because of the thoughtful intention they brought to the visioning process and to the work that they were already doing, Emerging from this process came a new idea that could be summed up in two words, engage diversity. It started off small for us. It began with a single work day with half a dozen people and a $500 donation to Habitat for Humanity. But slowly but surely over the weeks and months and years, this turned into summer work weeks and monthly work days, into shared offering plates and legislative advocacy and mentoring relationships with the new homeowners with Habitat. As our commitment as a congregation grew to safe and affordable housing for everyone, our imagination grew too. We found that we wanted to do more, to live even more fully into who we were and, who, and what we believe, our belief that each and every person is whole and holy and worthy of basic human needs. A small group of our church leaders gathered and they'd been doing some imagining while they were out there pounding nails and they came in and met with the ministers. They'd been dreaming and wondering what would happen if we became the primary sponsor for a whole house with Habitat for Humanity. 
Now this would mean we'd need to provide volunteers for two full work weeks and at least one day a month for a whole year. We'd have to provide the mentor for the new homeowner after she moved in, and we'd need to bring a large crew of folks from the congregation to Habitat on the Hill, the Legislative Advocacy Day in the spring. And yeah, we'd need to raise $60,000 outside of our operating budget. That too. <laughs> we named this project the House That Love Built, and we took a deep breath, and we got busy together. We decided that we would invite the congregation to reclaim the meaning of the winter holidays, to focus on love and hope instead of on things. We asked the congregation to cut back on their holiday spending and to put what they saved together as a church community to fund the house that love built. And I'll tell you that what happened next surprised every single one of us. Pretty soon, these enormous glass jars appeared right outside our sanctuary doors, and the kids from the congregation had put them there so that any time anyone came into the church, they could just drop their change into the jars, and we could see how we were doing. A couple of folks got together, and they, built, they made this gorgeous handmade quilt that they then auctioned off to the congregation. It went to the highest bidder, who then turned around and donated the quilt to the family that would be moving in to the house that Love built. We had folks gather together and use the kitchen to can homemade chutney and sell it. The kids in the religious education program got together and baked cookies and sold them after church on Sunday mornings. And donations started to come in from people that we didn't even know. They came in from all around the country and it turned out they were coming in because members and friends of the congregation had shared with their families, their extended families and friends, they didn't, they didn't want things for the holidays this winter. They wanted them to make a donation so we could make this house real. So when the day finally came in the end of December and we collected all of the gifts, we had asked for gifts of money and time and treasure, of pledges to volunteer and to help out and pledges to go and advocate at the state legislature. But what happened that day was something truly astounding. I gathered with the planning team afterward and we were counting all of the money that had come in and not only did we raise $60,000, we raised $120,000. We blew through what we ever thought was possible. That moment when I felt so much fear when we signed the promise, yes, we'll raise $60,000. It just, our imagination grew and grew and grew together. We were there on the day when the family moved in to the house that Love built. We made their beds, we set up the furniture together and we are still in relationship with them as they live into their own dreams of safety and stability and a future they could hardly even imagine together. I love that we built this house together, but what I love even more about this story is the way that it cracked open our imagination as a congregation about who we could be and what we could do in the world. Our sense of commitment and clarity grew after this experience. We deepened our racial justice learning and understanding and we began to apply that racial justice lens to everything that we were doing, including trying to help solve the housing disparities in our city. We partnered with an interfaith organization that provides emergency shelter for homeless families, much like it sounds like you do with Family Promise. We became a sanctuary congregation like Jan talked about. We declared ourselves a safe place of protection for folks who are at risk of deportation. And in the last year, we raised five and a half million dollars together in a capital campaign titled Not For Ourselves Alone, Building an Inclusive Future, which is all about making our building a resource, not just for ourselves as a church community, but for our entire community. Daring to dream, moving forward with clarity and conviction and risk helped us to become more than we could have ever been and done alone. This is what it means to be a part of a community of conviction and clarity and commitment, a community living out its faith in all that it does. We're grateful to be on this journey. Thank you for sharing a powerful stories. At a training that I attended about interim ministry this past fall, there were a room full of clergy and we were asked to picture our congregations as if they were a car. And we were asked, who's driving the church? If you have four passengers in your sedan and they are vision, relationships, programs and administration, who's driving? Who's in the seat, the driver's seat? Who's in the passenger front seat? Like helping to navigate, you know, check on the phone, make sure you're going where you're supposed to go. Who's sitting in the back seat? 
If you have vision, relationships, programs, and administration, where are they in your car? And she placed in each corner of the room one of those areas, and she asked us to move ourselves about and stand where we thought our congregation, like who was in the driver's seat. And it was surprising and disheartening to see what happened next. So for many, relationships were driving the church, and in some, the programs were important, and in uh, several, administration was driving it, but not a single person stood in the vision corner. And she said the goal is to have vision sitting in that driver's seat, right? And she said what you want is to see vision in the driver's seat, and then you've got relationships in the passenger seat up front. Relationships that are formed in support of that vision. So not just to be a community club or a place to just hang out with your friends, but, but people who have commitment and conviction and a sense of purpose who are working towards something that adds meaning beyond just a relationship, a transformative unleashing of their powerful love together. And that then in the back seat, you would have programs, programs like Coming of Age and OWL, Our Whole Lives, programs like Wellspring, like Soul Matters, that solely exist to create relationships that are in service of this ultimate purpose that we share. And administration sits in the back seat, and it works to support the vision and the programs. And she said, you know, a community might have a sense of their vision for a while. They might really galvanize around something, and, and you might have a life cycle in that congregation where you work really hard and you have a vision and you dream, and, and then you might just find yourselves resting. And the vision may go, ha, oh, tag out. <laughs> and the vision may end up sitting in the back seat. And administration is like, I will do this. And administration starts driving your congregation. And we were asked which corner to stand in. And I struggled to think about what's driving our congregation. We are about more than relationships. I knew it wasn't just relationships. People here have a sense of purpose about why we come together. People have a vision for a meaningful life and what our Unitarian Universalist faith calls us to. And we've created powerful programs that support those relationships in service of a vision. And our administration is strong in figuring out how do we do things well. But what became clear to me is while there is vision in our congregation, I think it exists in pockets. I think multiple visions exist. And what I don't hear is a clearly articulated connection between those visions. Don't hear the clearly articulated story of who we are and why we exist here together, what we're here to do. And Jen will know all of the things I'm pulling out today are things I learned on my internship in serving the Rochester congregation with her, where we would talk a lot about Andy Stanley and this uh, church growth guru who would liken a church to being a baseball team. And he said, so only if you're in a church, winning is not that clear, right? It's not that simple to quantify what is a win in a church. But a baseball team is pretty simple, right? They try to hit and get as many people around the bases back to home base as possible. In fact, they want to get more around a home base than the other team. That's their win. But in church life, it's not that easy for us always to clarify what is our win. But if we don't, Andy Stanley would say, that the people who step into leadership are going to be the people who identify the win for themselves. And that's a strength, and we need that. We need people to have a sense of ownership and vision of the church. But the challenge is if we don't have that clarified among the different pockets, what we're ultimately here to achieve, then we can find ourselves competing over our resources, our time, our attention, competing over and wondering, huh, how do we prioritize what goes into our budget? What gets shared in services? What goes on our website or our intercom email? Because we can inundate you with a lot of activity, right? And if we don't clarify the win, Andy Stanley would say, we're like this car, we are the car, but our wheels are not aligned. And you know what happens if your tires are all going in different directions, right? It's not very fun to drive that thing. And over time, it damages the structural integrity of the car and its ability to function. 
And so my colleagues just shared some powerful stories about what happened when people shared a sense of purpose, grounded in our faith of what brings meaning to our lives. Stories where they came together to do what they couldn't do alone. I love also Reggie McNeil, another resource that I was introduced to at a staff training at the Unitarian Universalist Congregation in Rochester. Reggie McNeil, man, the man I shared about in the opening words, he said that church is not our final destination, it's here to help us do life. And he said that he works with people who are trying to figure out their own mission in their congregations, and they are thinking not just about their own church, but they're saying, is our city better off for the fact that we're here? He said he works with congregations who have actually had the courage to hook their metrics to the quality of life of people in their community, not just to the quality of church programs. He said if abundant life is not pouring through us and we're not helping to lift everyone up, then the kingdom is not coming. And we're just fooling ourselves with a bunch of activity that maybe gives us some jollies and we feel good, but does it matter? One of the congregations he worked with decided that they wanted to end hunger among school-aged children in their county. They found that 95% of the kids in the Dallas school district were on free and reduced lunches. And he said, you know, they're hungry because they go home not to a banquet, but to nothing. And because kids can't learn on an empty stomach, it has implications way just beyond hunger. And he said, let me tell you how important this is. If a kid gets out of fourth grade unable to read at a fourth grade reading level, and he said, you're going to be responsible for what I'm going to tell you in a moment, okay? So if you need to go la 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 through this because you don't want to be responsible, then you go ahead and do that. But he says you can't crank up the organ music of the church to drown out the town you live in. You've got to listen. He says if a kid gets out of elementary school and they can't read at a fourth grade level, every single health life indicator for that kid plummets. It heads south. Poor jobs, poor health care, poor marriages, gangs, drugs, family, broken families, every single quality of life for a kid. And so he says, my question to you is, why does any kid get out of school not being able to read at a fourth grade level when our churches are full of people who can? What are we thinking? He said, in fact, I was telling this to a group of of people in a church and a woman there said, you know what, I actually work on the Governor's Commission of something or other in Florida. And she said that we calculate the number of beds we're going to need in our, in our state's prison system based on fourth grade reading retention levels. Hmm. That's how serious this is. And what are we doing? I mean, it's like he says, it's like that story where people ask Jesus, what's really important? And he said, well, Love God and love your neighbor. And then he tells a story about church people who didn't get it, they're so busy, but the semi-pagan or whatever comes along and he gets all the kudos because he gets off his donkey and he actually does something. Now that's a great sermon title, by the way, Reggie says. Get off your donkey and do something. <laughs> and just in two years, the church now processes over 6,000 pounds of food each week into over 1,000 backpacks. And he said, you know what that's done in the schools? Attendance is up on Fridays and on Mondays. Visits to the school nurse are down. Test scores are up. <sighs> I love Reggie, he says. Now, I know that we don't have much scriptural witness that Jesus cared about kids, but just think if we did. <laughs> Jesus might be wondering, what are you doing down there? You're cranking out more stuff at church. But get out there, change the lives of those kids, change the trajectories of their whole lives. And that's what happened when the church changes the scorecard and says, we have the courage to be here for life and for love. Many of us came to Unitarian Universalism because our other religious traditions, they didn't feel like they were here for life. It didn't feel like, it felt like too often the messages were wounding people, were judging people, were kicking them out. Too often, we didn't feel that the message was opening wide enough with humility and love to hold the real world and all its people and its diversity. Am I right? Yeah. So we have the opportunity to actually say, well, then what are we here for? We have the opportunity to declare that we're here to get better at loving those that society tells us we should shut out, that we're here 
to hold on to our faith in each other and in love, no matter how often the world says, that's not enough. We're here to figure out how we can more often honor all that gives our life meaning. So let's embrace the visioning process that is coming up this winter and spring as our shared spiritual practice, as a sacrament of our faith. Let's clarify our win and set to, together, let's set loose our boldness. Yeah? Hmm. Yeah, Amen. let's do it. Amen. All right. So come and go with me to this land. I invite you to rise and body your spirit and sing, Come and Go With Me.